Hi Norman. Um, preparing this interview, um, I was actually reading um, the biography of Emma Goldman, and I, I came to um, uh, sort of um, some a quote, and I'd like to read it to you because I thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, she said this in 1910. My great faith in the wonder worker, the spoken word, is no more. I have realized its inadequacy to awaken thought or even emotion. Gradually, and with no small struggle against this realization, I came to see that oral propaganda is at best but a means to shake people from their lethargy. It leaves no lasting impression. But then she continues by saying, the relation between the writer and the reader is more intimate. True, books are only what we want them to be, rather what we read into them. That we can do so demonstrates the importance of written as against oral expression. So I think, I mean, you know Emma Goldman gave hundreds also of like lectures, etc. I think what she meant, and I can, I can sort of understand it, that you go to a conference and you hear someone speak, you know, anyone, you can meet Norman Fieldstone, Norman Chomsky, and um, I think there's some people who just listen to it and um, you, look, you know, wake during the, uh, the conference emotions and feelings, but then they go back home and what do they actually take and what do they do after the conference does make them more active. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure, maybe a small percentage of them. A book is a different relationship between the author cause, and, 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 the, and the, the reader. Well, each medium has its uh, advantages and it has its limitations. The thing about a, um, a lecture is people do like to make human contact. They don't just want to relate to a, uh, an object. And human contact means not just with the lecturer, they like the human contact of people around them. You know, human beings are we know from a long time ago they're social animals and they enjoy the physical interaction. That's why I don't think, for example, that what's now becoming quite popular, pervasive, is teaching through video, uh, replacing the college classroom. Anyone who's a professor, that's a travesty. You can't reproduce on a screen the kind of, if you want to use the word, electricity that occurs in the classroom. Uh, the physical contact between the student and the teacher and also the student and the other students. Doing it via lecturing, via Skype or video conferencing, it's so alienating and estranging. Well, you know, sometimes there's a need for it. Uh, it's much easier for me to do it than with Saudi students than going to Jeddah, and so I've done it that way. But to say it duplicates the classroom experience, well, that's just silly. Uh, the reason a book might, ha might have a more sustained effect is because it takes longer to read a book. Mm -hmm. A lecture lasts two hours at most. Uh, a book, you have to engage it for around a week. It's also true to say that you can uh, engage a book sometimes in a more dynamic way than a lecturer. First of all, you can sit down and analyze the argument. That's very difficult with a lecturer because with a book, you can go back and check the steps in the logic. Does B follow from A? Does C follow from B? You can flip to the footnotes, check is this source really documenting what the book, uh, what the text says? So you can have a lot more, a much deeper relationship with a book than you ever have with a lecturer. But each serves its purpose, I think. Um, people read and read Chomsky for one kind of relationship with, to him, but they also flock to his lectures for a second kind of relationship, and both are very cerebral relationships. Uh, Professor Chomsky is devoid of any verbal flourishes, any kind of pyrotechnics, and he's very purposeful in that. He says he wants to only convince by reason. So both relationships are very cerebral. Um, 
or strictly cerebral. Uh, nonetheless, they are two very different experiences. And as I said, each has its uh, virtues and each has its limitations. Okay. I mean, I've, I've, By the way, I've read Emma Goldman. Uh, I read her autobiography. I've read her lectures. They're completely vacuous. They're totally empty. Uh, she was not a deep thinker. Uh, I suspect that they, you know, she, her most, uh, the reason she had such huge audiences were partly because the times were very turbulent uh, and because she, uh, she could be very passionate. But there's nothing in her lectures, complete zero. And that, that could be why she decided to concentrate on the uh, written word then. Her written word is zero also. I mean, I've read her autobiography. It's actually quite poor, and it's completely hypocritical. You know, I don't like this kind of hero worship. Mm. Uh, in the beginning of her autobiography, she's defending what she calls attentats. You know, yeah. instead of assassin, yeah, you're talking about political assassinations. Don't drag in some fancy Latin or French word to make it sound like something. It's not. You're assassinating people. And then later on in the autobiography, you'll see in, in um, uh, volume two, when you know, the person assassinates the president of the United States. I'm only at the beginning of volume one. Right, so. right. Well, yeah. one of the persons who listened to her said, OK, I think Emma's got a point. And he goes out and he kills the um, uh, president of the United States. And then she says, I had nothing to do with that. I don't believe in assassinations. What the hell are you talking about? You, that's exactly what you were advocating, you know. No, I, I'm, I was not very enthusiastic about her as a political figure.